Good morning. My name is Vicki Alexander Harriet. I'm the Dean of Faculty at Maharishi International University. I'm also the chair of the management department. Today, it is my great honor to introduce Tom Newmark. Tom has dedicated his life to saving our planet for the next generation. He's a man who walks his talk. He's the co-owner of Finca Luna Nueva Lodge, a farm and eco lodge in the mountainous rainforest of Costa Rica that teaches regenerative agriculture. He's the co-founder and board chair of the Carbon Underground, co-founder of the Soil Carbon Initiative and a founding member of that standards design team. He's past board chair of the Greenpeace Fund USA and a founding member of the Leadership Council of the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems at California State University, Chico. He's a strategic, I'm very happy to say that he is a strategic advisor to Maharishi International University's Sustainable and Regenerative Living Department. He is also the past board chair of the American Botanical Council, publisher of the peer-reviewed journal, Herbal Gram. He was CEO of the dietary supplement brand, New Chapter, 
which was acquired by Procter & Gamble in 2012. In his past, he was also a corporate attorney from which he claims to be recovering. Tom and his wife, Terry, have five children and six grandchildren. It's my great delight to introduce you to Tom Newmark. Please send any questions you would like to ask Tom to questions at tm.org. And now Tom. Hi, Vicki, thank you very much. Allow me to get my screen set up. And uh, this is always a little dicey. Give me just one moment here. Are you seeing my title screen? Yes. We are. Very good. And as uh, you can see, folks, uh, I've encaptioned my remarks. What tastes great and reverses climate change? Eating is an act of radical regeneration. It's been 20 years since I lived in Fairfield. My wife, Terry, and I lived on East Jackson. I had a home there and an office there, but I left 20 years ago. So a lot of you do not remember me, do not know me. And I thought, since you were so kind to invite me to speak to you today about regenerative agriculture and climate change, that I would do so in the context of reintroducing myself to the Fairfield community. Hi, my name is Tom. I destroyed the planet. I was born in 1952, at which point in time there were approximately 315 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. I went to Ladue High School in St. Louis and I was graduated in 1970 when there were approximately 325 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere and I had no clue. Uh, then my college years. I spent a lot of time thinking about Vietnam, revolution, meditation and stuff. I never once thought about the climate crisis in any way. Nevertheless, the parts per million of CO2 in 1970 were at 325 and by 1974 were at 329 representing the transfer of 29 billion tons of CO2 from below ground to the atmosphere. I've got to give myself a C because I was young, I was anticipating the dawning of the age of enlightenment. And frankly, for those of us alive back then with me, no one was talking about climate change back then. Now, now we're getting closer to uh, my, my Fairfield days. I call these the dawning of the age of enlightenment years, 1974 to 1977. I dropped out of graduate school. My dad was not happy about that. I taught TM full time around the country and I never once thought about climate change. Parts per million during this time period went from 329 to 333, representing the transfer of 29 billion tons of CO2 from below ground to the atmosphere. Uh, then my years of amoral desperation, which I describe as law school and my practice as a business litigator from which, as Vicki said, I am hoping to be recovering. From 1977 to 1999, the parts per million of CO2 went from 333 to 367, representing the transfer of 250 billion tons of CO2 from below ground to the atmosphere. And while that was happening, I fathered three children, I made a lot of money, and I never gave one serious thought to climate change and my planetary grade was an F. Now, why was it an F? Because in 1988, this happened, cover of the New York Times in June of 1988. And in this cover article, Dr. James Hansen, the director of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies stated, 
I would like to draw three main conclusions. Number one, the earth is warmer in 1988 than at any time in the history of instrumental measurements. Number two, the global warming is now large enough that we can ascribe with a high degree of confidence a cause and effect relationship to the greenhouse effect. And number three, our computer climate simulations indicate that the greenhouse effect is already large enough back in 1988, remember, to begin to affect the probability of extreme events such as summer heat waves. And boy, wasn't he right. But while that was on the front page of the New York Times, I didn't pay any attention. And I'm quite sure I didn't care. Now my segue to being an entrepreneur, my new chapter years, 1999 to 2012, parts per million of CO2 went from 370 to 396. 190 more billion tons of CO2 went from below ground to the atmosphere, and I did not do enough to stop that or plant the seeds for the reversal of those trends. And I, in, in uh, humility and candor and maybe in self-flagellation, I have to give myself still planetary grade of F. Because interestingly, the day that I started at New Chapter, March 15, 1999, on that very day, Dr. Michael Mann and others published their famous hockey stick chart demonstrating beyond any doubt that our planet was being cooked to death by climate change. And I can't say that I didn't know any better or I didn't realize we could respond through business to climate change because I did. In 2008, my daughter Sarah and I went to the Rodale Institute and I learned how to heal the planet with regenerative agriculture as distinct from conventional destructive extractive chemical agribusiness. Thank you to Tim LaSalle at the Rodale Institute. But I kept running the company to grow it. That was what I was told I had to do as an entrepreneur, as a CEO, which reminds me of the saga of the impossible hamster. From birth to puberty, a hamster doubles its weight each week. If it didn't stop when mature, as animals do, and continue to double on its first birthday, he's staring at a nine billion hamster. This hamster could eat all of the corn produced annually worldwide in a single day and still be hungry. There is a reason why, in nature, things grow in size only to a certain point. So why do most economists and politicians think that the economy can grow forever and ever and ever? So even though I should have thought about the impossible hamster, I didn't because I had to feed that impossible hamster as the leader of a modern day uh, uh, capitalist enterprise. And I led New Chapter until 2012, at which point we commenced a merger and acquisition process. And during that process, which lasted one year, at no time did anyone once talk about parts per million of carbon or climate change. At no time did anyone ask how we could draw legacy CO2 down from the atmosphere and put it back underground. And I apologize to the planet. Nevertheless, I sold the company and the climate was a disaster, a hot mess. My children's future comfort, security, food, water supply, and even ability to exist on this planet was at severe risk, that biodiversity was collapsing. And I left the business world with the planet more impoverished in every meaningful way than when I started 
on March 15, 1999. My final planetary report card as a business person is an F. But Tim LaSalle at the Rodale Institute had lit my green fire. And after I retired from business, I became board chair of the Greenpeace Fund. And I launched with my buddy, Larry Copal, the Carbon Underground. And you're thinking, yeah, I cashed in my chips and it's easy for me to take shots at capitalism from the skybox. And you're right, but I persisted. And now I'm gonna lay out for you the problem. The problem is that in pre-industrial Earth, there were about 270 parts per million of CO2, a greenhouse gas trapping heat in the atmosphere. Right now, this year, you've actually gotten to over 416, but I'm kind of rounding to where I think the planet will be at the end of this year. We're at 415 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. So there are 145 new parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from before the Industrial Revolution to now. And that represents 290 billion tons, gigatons of carbon that went from underground into the atmosphere. And when you translate carbon to CO2, that's over a trillion tons of CO2 that we humans have put into the atmosphere. And we need to draw those down. Otherwise we will be cooking the planet and cooking the future. Where do we put them? We put them into what is called a carbon sink. And the only available carbon sink left on the planet that we can use is the soil because the oceans are already beyond full. They're already overly acidified by CO2. And there aren't enough forest or pasture or plains areas to soak up the carbon in above ground biomass. And we can't create new coal and, and gas and, and oil. That takes geologic time. We're in a hurry. So the only sink available to us is the soil. And fortunately, there is a time-tested technology that permits us to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it back into the soil, and that is photosynthesis. And the soil wants its carbon back. Mother Earth wants her carbon back. So we have a solution right beneath our feet. The solution is to reverse the problems that we created through our agricultural malpractice, through what I call tilling, putting a knife through the flesh of Mother Earth, through killing, through pouring uh, pesticides and synthetic fertility onto Mother Earth's living soil. And what we know is that since the dawn of modern agriculture, between 200 to 300 billion tons of CO2 out of that trillion of excess legacy CO2, two to 300 billion tons have been released to the atmosphere because of agricultural malpractice. Between 25 to 40% of the current mess that we're in resulted directly from our destroying the soil because of the agribusiness model. And as a result of that, because we are destroying the soil so quickly, the United Nations is actually predicting that if we continue with farming as usual, we will only have 60 harvests of food left. So let me, let me really put this into sharp focus. You've invited me to speak to you today. And I, I told Vicki and, and Carol and the other organizers that my remarks in chief would be for 40 minutes and we'll see how close I get. And don't be too punitive, Vicki, if I go a little bit over and we'll leave plenty of time for questions. But during my little talk with you all today, 
let's do some math together. If there are 37 billion tons of human source CO2 emitted per year, which is a good estimate, that means that, means that if there are 525,600 minutes in a year, and there are 40 minutes in my presentation, my presentation to you today, our being together, our conversation, is 0.00761% of the year, which means that there will be 2 million, I have to read closely, 2 million 815,829.53 tons of CO2 emitted by humans polluting the atmosphere during this talk. Happy Sunday morning, right? And to translate the heat consequences of having all those added hundreds of billions of tons of CO2 to the atmosphere during the past few decades and 2.815 million tons of CO2 being emitted while we're talking together this morning. The heat equivalent of about 400,000 Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs is trapped by greenhouse gases in the atmosphere every day, which means that during my 40 minutes of talking to you today, about 11 thousand of those Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs and their heat consequence went off and were trapped in the atmosphere. The good news is that there is a strategy to get from 415 parts of CO2 down to the livable pre-industrial level of 270 parts per million. It's the organization that I founded. It's called the Carbon Underground. And it's all about putting that legacy carbon back whence it came. And here's how it works in a quick summary. This is a highly simplified diagram of the soil food web. Now, there are some graphs up there with uh, nice green leafy matter and the roots and the leaves are structured as solar panels, capturing photons of solar energy. And they use that captured solar energy to break apart CO2, carbon dioxide, which the leaves can take in from the atmosphere, drawing down carbon dioxide. And they can, they can use that solar power to break apart the H2O, the water, which they can draw up through the roots. And using that solar power to break apart CO2 and H2O, they can re-scramble those atoms and create carbohydrates, right? We all love carbohydrates, those sweet sugars. And why do plants create those sugars? Well, the same reason why we want to eat them, because that's, that is concentrated stored solar energy. That's how all life on earth is fueled by solar energy made biologically available through the process of photosynthetic capture of photons and storing that energy into those sugars. Now, the grass doesn't need, or the trees or algae or whatever, whatever green life you can imagine, they don't need all of the solar sugar, the, the liquid carbon that plants create during photosynthesis. They use some of it to satisfy their metabolic needs, but here's an interesting challenge for a plant. Plants can drink in energy from the sun and they can speak the language of CO2. Wouldn't it be cool if we could? We can't. We need oxygen to fuel our metabolic engine. But plants can speak carbon, can speak carbon dioxide. Ironically, even though the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, plants can't speak nitrogen. And they need nitrogen in order to create amino acids and proteins. And they need phosphorus. And they need potassium and selenium and iron and 
you know, I used to run a dietary supplement company. They need their vitamins and their minerals, just like we need our vitamins and our minerals. Where are those nutrients that plants need? Uh, where's the nitrogen? Where's the iron? Where's the selenium? Ah, it's there in the soil. But who knows how to speak nitrogen? Bacteria can speak nitrogen. Who can speak selenium and phosphorus and potassium and magnesium and all those, those, those metals and minerals? Turns out that there are solubilizing bacteria that can speak the language of those elements. And then who knows how to communicate, to, to truck, to transport those elements that are biologically made available by solubilizing bacteria. Who can bring those to plants? I wish I could see a show of hands, but I'm sure some of you know that it's fungi, that in every little thimble full of soil, there is maybe a mile or more of mycelium, those little thin white threads of life that are conduits of nutrients that are made biologically available by bacteria because the bacteria and the fungi, they need carbon. And the plants need nitrogen and selenium and phosphorus. So we've got an opportunity here, back to my business background, to have a commodities exchange, to have an underground exchange of nutrients. And so the plants, as you see in this chart, are creating sugars which they then pass through their roots, they exude root exudates of carbohydrates and the plants are signaling, I need potassium, who's got it? And the bacteria and the fungi are saying, ah, we've got it, but, I, but we work for sugar. So if you give me a cookie, I'll give you potassium. And this is going on at every moment in time in the living, breathing, uh, body of Mother Earth and the bacteria and the fungi are, are growing and they're being fed by the liquid carbon, the, 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 the sugary sunlight, and they're, they're growing and they're excreting and they're dying and they're, 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 they are creating yet more cookies underground. Think about that because all of this organic matter is being passed through the roots of plants into the soil food web. And as the soil food web multiplies, divides, excretes, and dies, necromass, literally the mass of the life and death of, of the living soil is building. These cookies are building through the soil and there are cookies everywhere. And yet the bacteria want to eat those cookies. But if you eat all the cookies that are being created, then you're not going to build soil and you will not be creating the sequestration of CO2 in the soil. So what does it take to actually slow things down in the soil so that all that liquid carbon, all that sugar, all those cookies that form can actually stay in the soil? and create the tilth and the humus, that sweet smell of, of topsoil. What does it take? Uh, and that was my big 19, 2019 revelation. Informed by key research at Michigan State University. It turns out that if you wanna build soil using photosynthesis, you have to be able to hide those cookies that are created out of the necromass. You have to hide the cookies in nooks and crannies so tiny that not even little kids with teensy weensy fingers can reach in to get them. The bacteria that decompose, that want to eat those sugars can't get at those sugars. And so the soil can build and the soil can grow. And, and from that Michigan State University study, and this is going to get a little wonky, Forgive me, but it's, it's, this is a university community, so I'm going to get a little wonky here. I'm going to read to you 
on the next two slides from the study, because it's the whole story. Plant roots are the key agents in the formation of soil pore architecture. Pores in the 30 to 150 micron size range are the potential location of new carbon inputs and active microbial communities where the active processing of carbon input takes place. The greater the volume of the soil matrix in contact with such pores, the greater the potential for microbial decomposition to be transported to and protected within the soil matrix inaccessible to microbial decomposers. I bet that's clear as mud to everyone, right? What it's basically saying is you got to hide the cookies and you got to hide the cookies in pores so small that the decomposing bacteria can't get to them. Now, let me show you what happens if you don't have those pores. Here's Pac-Man. Here are the cookies. If you don't have the pores, then Pac-Man, the decomposing bacteria, it's, they're going to eat all the cookies. And when Pac-Man does, forgive me, what you were just seeing there is the silent but deadly way, the off-gassing of microbial activity where much of our CO2 has ended up in our atmosphere. But if we have lots of places to hide the cookies, then everything is different. Quote from the article, biological factors are thus likely to dominate. Differences in root architecture, strength and root biomass and mycorrhization are well known to affect soil porosity and amounts and composition of root exudates are likewise affected by root characteristics. Here's the key sentence. Here's the key to all of survival of life on the planet going forward. 2019 article, Michigan State. Here's the key sentence. Memorize it, you'll be tested. Systems with greater plant diversity have greater, a greater variety of root architectures with corresponding different effects on porosity. Wow, so that's the key sentence for all of life and the future of life on earth? Yeah, it is. Because if you've got lots of plant diversity with lots of roots of different shapes and depths and sizes and different exudates with places to store the carbon that is being drawn down from the atmosphere and fed into the soil food web, here's what happens to Mr. Pac-Man when he tries to eat that carbon because now the carbon has found a place to hide. It's found the cookie jars. And when the decomposers try and eat it, they can't get to it. And plant diversity looks different in different ecosystems. You've got on the far left, a, a, a tropical ecosystem. In, in the upper right, that's actually Minnesota at Reginaldo Haslett Marquin's tree range poultry system, a, a chicken farm, a poultry farm, using plant diversity in multiple crops like hazelnut trees and elderberry and nettle and mulberry. So it can even happen with poultry production. So we can begin to imagine growing our way out of climate change. So the carbon underground and green America and Danone and Unilever and hundreds of agronomists and farmers and environmental activists got together and created the Soil Carbon Initiative. We introduced a, a verifiable standard designed to change how we grow food and fiber. And there are four indicia, the four pillars of regenerative agriculture under the Soil Carbon Initiative and how interesting that the Soil Carbon Initiative, SCI is the name of it. So it really should resonate with, uh, with the uh, MIU community. Here are the four pillars, the four ways you can recognize that a producer, a farmer or rancher is producing 
agricultural output regeneratively. Number one, soil organic matter, that liquid carbon, that sweet sugary sunlight that gets drawn down by photosynthesis and exuded through the roots and then stored in the pores. Soil organic matter, which we call tilth or humus, will increase stepwise over time. Not every year, there'll be variations year to year, but over time, over three, four, five, ten years, decades, there'll be increases in soil organic matter. Number two, the soil structure and stability will improve. The, the carbon that gets put underground won't wash away in the rain. Number three, this will be accomplished biologically. We're not doing this through some newfangled carbon capture and storage technology. This has been achieved above and below ground through the living, breathing biological diversity of the soil food web and above ground biodiversity. Rather than farming based on pesticides and synthetic chemicals, this standard, SCI, rewards biologically farming that leads to more life force, more beneficial microorganisms and fauna. And finally, the fourth indicia, the land will improve, will enjoy improved water management. There'll be better rainfall infiltration. The rains will be more effective where the soil organic matter acts as a water battery. Now I wanna go back and remind you that we have over a trillion tons of excess CO2 in the atmosphere. And we have to draw down a trillion tons of CO2 and put it back to work in the soil. In the atmosphere, it threatens our future. In the atmosphere, we are facing an existential peril which endangers all of life on earth as, as we treasure it. But if you draw it down, it converts from a toxin to a tonic. But we need to draw down a trillion tons. That requires a global strategy, a global footprint. And fortunately, we've got one because there are 3.5 billion hectares of grasslands. There are 1.5 billion hectares of arable farmland. There are a billion hectares of former and degraded forest land that could be reforested, mangrove forests, sea grass meadows, salt marshes, seaweed aquaculture called blue carbon sequestration. It's virtually unlimited in the open seas. And let's just look at what some agronomists and, and farmers have either achieved or have confirmed in studies. Dr. Nair from Florida, uh, looking at agroforestry in a cacao plantation in Costa Rica, showed that year after year, that agroforestry, agroecological way of growing cacao with lots of other trees, multi-species, multi-strata, all the sunlight being captured by different heights and shapes and, and orientations of leaves, all that carbon passing through that structure, 10 plus tons of carbon per hectare per year being captured and put back on the soil. In Australia, in silvopasture, Dr. Christine Jones measured nine tons of carbon per hectare per year. Dr. Alan Williams, a livestock geneticist, looking at adaptive multi-paddock grazing, which is very similar, different, different nomenclature, but very similar to what you, you see from Alan Savory's holistic livestock management, nine tons of carbon sequestered per hectare per year. Using holistic management, the University of Georgia in a dairy operation, up to eight tons of carbon sequestered per hectare per year. Richard Teague at Texas A&M, looking at cattle ranching, three tons of carbon sequestered, which means drawn down and put safely in those nooks and crannies, those soil pores, so that Pac-Man can't get to it 
and the soil tilth and humus builds up, Rowan Bunch, who, who might just be the most important uh, agronomist on the planet today, and he'll be speaking to the MIU community, as will Dr. Nair and Richard Teague, and you'll see uh, Edward Mulder and David Johnson. Many of these folks will be speaking in the next few months to the MIU community. Roland, looking at tens of millions of farmers using green manure cover cropping worldwide, showing on average six tons of carbon per hectare per year. Edward Mueller, one of my colleagues in Costa Rica, 120 tons sequestered in both below and above ground biomass in a bamboo plantation per year. David Johnson and his partner Hui Chun Su in row crops using uh, optimized compost that is fungally dominated, but it's row crops of, of, of produce, 11 tons per hectare per year. Folks, you might be glazing over with all these numbers, but try and imagine with me the drawdown potential. If we've got 5 billion hectares of grasslands and arable land to work with on planet Earth, and if people are seeing 10 tons, 120 tons, 11 tons, three tons on a conservative level per hectare per year, imagine if we could adopt regenerative agriculture worldwide. Try and tumble those numbers in your brain this Sunday morning, but let me help you out because someone else actually has just done this math. Dr. N Dr. Ratan Lau, who will also be speaking to the MIU community uh, in a few months. One of the most respected soil scientists in the world. His work has guided Vice President Al Gore's journey into carbon sequestration and regenerative agriculture. You'll find his research underlying the conclusions of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. And what he wrote is that the soil carbon sink capacity from now to the end of this century, with the global adoption of best management practice, which creates a positive soil ecosystem carbon budget, is estimated at 178 picograms billion tons of carbon for soil, 155 billion tons for biomass. So soils below ground, biomass above ground. Therefore in an aggregate, 333 picograms for the terrestrial biosphere with a total carbon drawdown potential of 157 parts per million. Ladies and gentlemen, we've just returned to below pre-industrial levels of CO2. That is the green revolution that the world really needs. No one can say that we've got this. We're not completely satisfied with the research. The carbon sequestration data are, are not yet unassailable in their proof of the climate case, but the data are strong enough encouraging enough that they point the way forward. They gave me hope. I hope that this conversation we're having this morning gives you hope. Hope for planetary healing, to food abundance, and to the possibility of a green and cool future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom. This has really been sobering, but I think very inspiring. And uh, we have some comments from our listeners. Somebody says, this is a great presentation. The content, of course, but the slides and you being visible as you talk works very well. So thank you for this presentation. This is from our listeners. Um, uh, we also have a question about uh, whether this talk is available for school children. Would you have something that we can show eight-year-olds? There actually has been a book written 
by uh, Steve Applebaum, who is a soil scientist uh, who teaches as an adjunct at Harvard, explaining the story to children. So uh, Vicki, I'll, I'll make sure I'll get you the reference to, to, uh, to Steve's book. That's great, thank you. Um, we also have a question wondering if Greta Thunberg knows what you found. Is she involved in this movement? Well, I, I think that she is aware. Uh, Greta, uh, a hero, uh, is very much involved with Greenpeace. Uh, Greenpeace has worked extensively with her in, in Europe and in the United States. And I have friends within the Greenpeace organization who have been in quite uh, close contact with Greta. I personally haven't chatted with her uh, about this, but I would imagine given that, that my friends on Greenpeace hear about this from me nonstop, they might be tired of hearing about it from me. I, I would imagine that she's fully aware of this and uh, we need that young visionary energy and heart uh, clearly. Um, we also have a question asking about whether planting more trees would also be important. Is this part of the plan? You know, I, I have uh, great reverence for forests and great reverence for, uh, for prairies. And uh, you, want, you want forests to be forests. They, they should, to use nomenclature that familiar with, uh, with, there's a dharma to being a forest. And, there's, and, and that place on earth that has been forested, uh, we should have, we should, are you, is the internet okay? Are yeah. you able to hear me, Vicki? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, Oh, yes, yeah, so absolutely. Where where it is uh, where it is natural and appropriate to reforest, uh, it would be a very appropriate thing to reforest, and that will help uh, in in this endeavor. In the grasslands, there are 3.5 billion hectares of prairies of grasslands. Uh, there's been this this push and pull. This uh, this ballet between grasslands and forests over the evolutionary history of the planet. So grasslands should be grasslands and forests should be forests. And they each have their, their charm and their beauty and their carbon sequestration opportunity. What's really so interesting is it is possible, especially in the tropics where I have my farm, and where the majority of children are born on earth today. You can grow food agroecologically within the context of a forest. This was the genius of the, the indigenous farmers in the Amazon. And that Amazonian wisdom came up through uh, the land bridge up into Costa Rica where I have my farm. You can produce copious, abundant, nourishing food inside of a forest. And uh, uh, there is a concept called home garden, not a home garden like we have, like a little home, but home gardening where in your, in your small footprint around your home in the tropics, you actually recreate a tropical forest with trees, with perennials, with annuals. So long answer to the person's important question, Trees are critically important to this. We have to learn how to work in harmony with forests and to be able to produce food in a way that nourishes and make forests even stronger. Thank you so much. <clears throat> We've got another question asking whether we can still keep driving our cars and save our planet using this information. Well, you know, we are emitting 37 billion tons of, of uh, CO2 every year of anthropogenic uh, carbon. And a lot of that is the combustion of fossil fuels. So this hopeful message of sequestration of regenerative agriculture is not to excuse uh, the, the burning of fossil fuels and fossil fuel emissions. This is not a hall pass, a doctor's note. That's <laughs> okay to do business as usual with the fossil fuel-based 
uh, oil and gas based, coal based economy. We have to transition off of fossil fuels. But you see the, the way this can work together because we're not gonna get off of fossil fuels overnight, but we can actually start burying the carbon. We can start re-sequestering the CO2 overnight. And by, by turning up the sequestration power through regenerative agriculture, we can buy the world and buy the human race time to figure out how to decarbonize the economy. So we clearly need to decarbonize, but by recarbonizing the soil, we give ourselves more runway, more time to figure out how to transition off of fossil fuels. Yes, yeah, so you're gonna to have to give up those fossil fuels. Can't hold on gonna, to that. Um, gonna have. <laughs> We've got some other great comments and questions. Somebody says, I'm excited to hear that you, will, that you will connect us with scholars, researchers, scientists in the future. Your presentation was lively and engaging with simple to understand illustrations. What are the major challenges to implementing this vision? Political, economic, social, and financial? That's just a little question. <laughs> That's a great one. Uh, the biggest challenge implementation as people with white beards like me. <laughs> it's, it's, it's this generation. When we, when we go around the world, and which my organization, the Carbon Underground, does, we, we travel worldwide and talk to farmers and governments and, and activists. We often hear, well, I would like to do that, but my dad. <laughs> or I would like to do this, but, but the elders in my community. So we need to, we need to have uh, the Greta Thunbergs on the political level and the young farmers that you're training at, at MIU and that are being educated and, and that are being released and, and seeding the world uh, today. It's the, it's the young farmers that will carry this message out. So there's a generational transition that has to occur. Uh, we need to have different policies. Uh, there are certain policies at the national level in the United States and worldwide that are, uh, that are stacking the deck, that are tilting the playing field in favor of extractive, industrial, chemical-based, nitrogen, fertilizer-based agriculture. Uh, the very nature of our federal crop insurance, uh, and boy, this is certainly the case in Iowa, which is, Iowa is... Uh, an, an ecosystem sacrifice zone. I mean, Iowa basically wall to wall is a hog production plant based on monoculture agriculture fueled by synthetic nitrogen inputs made, made possible by the support of federal crop insurance. So we need on a policy level to change. And fortunately, and you and Iowa know this better than most, because the primaries sweep through Iowa before anywhere else, and you got to see yeah. all the, the Democratic candidates. A lot of candidates these days are talking about regenerative agriculture. Even, even Vice President Biden is talking about paying farmers to sequester carbon. And some of the greatest, some of the greatest regenerative farmers in the world are conservative Trump Republicans. So fortunately, this is not a partisan issue. The soil is, is there to support all of us, regardless of political affiliation. Let's make American soil great again. And what we're gonna see as our politicians realize that we have got to deal with this trillion ton legacy of CO2, and the only place to put it is in the soil, we are seeing more and more in America in Costa Rica, in Thailand, in Finland, in areas where I've worked, governments are saying, this has got to happen. And finally, corporations managing their supply chains realize that they have got to figure out regenerative agriculture, otherwise they won't have cotton in the future or coffee or cacao in the future. So many of the world's largest corporations are now 
are now incentivizing their supply chains to become regenerative. So there will be a generational transition. There will be a consumer awakening. There'll be changes on the policy level and corporations will help drive this. All of these together will help conduce the regenerative revolution. Well, that's very, very good to know. I'm really glad to hear that it's not a partisan issue because uh, it can't be, it can't be. Um, I've also got a question on a more personal level. Somebody says, I'm a master gardener in Bellevue, Washington. What can I do? Well, the number one crop grown by uh, uh, gardeners, uh, homeowners in the United States is lawn grass. And lawn grass has uh, uh, very shallow roots. And if you followed along, the, the, the magic is happening at the root tips, the rhizosphere. It's where biology meets geology. So you want, you want plants that have deeper roots. And you also know from this presentation that biodiversity, that plant diversity, that root length and shape and size diversity, that's the whole game here. So if you're a gardener, you wanna follow those, those principles. You want plant diversity, you want perennials, and annuals, you want trees and flowers, you want to transition as much as possible away from the shallow rooted lawns that really don't do much to sequester carbon and are unfortunately right now a great sink of pesticides and synthetic fertilizers. So we wanna, we wanna treat our, our own little footprint more as a permaculture design opportunity. So to all home gardeners and to home uh, landscape designers, study permaculture design and consider the, that fundamental principle that the more diversity above ground, the more diversity below ground, the more carbon will be sequestered. A new question has just come in that I don't think I've actually ever heard before. And that is whether there is some advantage or, or use in putting CO2 into abandoned oil and gas wells. Is that a viable solution? Would it help? So I have a good buddy who used to work for Royal Dutch Shell. His name is Russ Conser. And uh, he's a brilliant uh, uh, engineer. And I went to a lecture uh, at the Alternative Energy Institute with, uh, with Russ and someone from Columbia University was talking about carbon capture and storage and putting concentrated CO2 into uh, abandoned oil and gas uh, structures and into salt domes and into uh, lock boxes or whatever. And I turned to Russ who's, who came from the fossil fuel industry and I said, yeah, did you guys at, at Shell ever look at this? And he said, oh yeah, we looked at it. Number one, the technology doesn't exist now to make it feasible. And number two, it would cost $33 trillion to even begin to get started. And then let me layer on top of this, you all know the problems with earthquakes and fracking. Remember you've been hearing about how there are more earthquakes now in Oklahoma than have ever been, been observed. And it's because we're, we're, you're, you're pumping pressurized water uh, into the structure of, of uh, the ground and fracturing it. Well, imagine pumping a trillion tons of CO2 in a pressurized way into below ground structures. What, what mischief will that wreak? What havoc will that wreak? Mm -hmm. um, the technology doesn't work. It's too expensive. Uh, it isn't available today. And God only knows the damage that it will cause. And the other thing is, if you put the CO2 back into a, into a, a locked structure below ground, it, it's like saying there's a, there's a trillion dollars of money in the atmosphere. Because CO2 
is, is captured coin of solar energy. That's the coin of the realm of, of sunlight. It's solar power. It's just up there waiting for us. Why wouldn't we want to bring it back down to earth where we can actually grow food with it? Why, why would we not want to use it as an asset rather than burying it where it's inert and unavailable to us? So I think on all levels, it doesn't make any sense. Having said that, if the technology changes, if we can figure out a way to take a vacuum cleaner and hoover up the CO2 and blast it off into outer space, maybe we have to go there. But photosynthesis has been proven to work over biological and geological time, and why wait? All right, that sounds... Uh... Very well thought through. I think it's it's a it's an interesting idea, but its time hasn't come yet, uh, and maybe for so. some reasons it will may, maybe never come. Um, we've had a couple questions from California. We're also running out of time, so I don't. I I've got one. I think that everybody probably wants to to hear the answer to. Uh, I know that organic certified organic isn't the same as regenerative, but is it still helpful to buy organic? Well, I have an organic farm in Costa Rica. My farm has always been organic. I'm an organic zealot. And my company was a pioneer of organic food within the dietary supplement space. So I will always encourage people to shop and look for organic food. But the, the modern organic program in the United States is a broken regulatory regime. I mean, all, you have to, all you have to look at is the fact that, that hydroponically grown food can be certified organic. And you can grow organic food uh, in bare earth in monocultures and in rows. Again, remember the 2019 study from Michigan State. It's all about diversity. So unfortunately, while organic is very helpful on a human health level, because we don't want to be eating the residues of toxic chemicals, in terms of the ecological health of Mother Earth, we have to go one step further. So regenerative agriculture, it exists with, with different metrics than organic. Organic is basically saying, under the National Organic Program, you can't use the following inappropriate input, inputs. So it requires obedience to a, a regulatory regime that is negative in nature. Regenerative agriculture is a positive outcomes-based concept. Is the system of food production and textile production regenerating, reviving, rebuilding, and restoring organic matter and biological diversity. If it is, then it's regenerative. So while I am still a fan of organic and I farm organically, I have layered onto that, to me, the more important uh, compass, the more important pole star to which I navigate, which is, is what I'm doing rebuilding the ecosystem? Thank you so much, Tom. And I'm really sad to say that we've got a lot of questions we haven't been able to ask. I think people have really been excited by your presentation. So thank you so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom and your passion. Uh, I think it's just been really fabulous. So thank you so much. And I'd like to remind oh everybody, thank you, thank you. I'd like to remind everybody that uh, next week we're gonna have a talk on Saturday from Dr. Tony Nader will be speaking on ideal leadership and you can view that at the same Zoom channel on Saturday at 11. And next Sunday, we will be replaying Dr. John Hagelin's outstanding talk on collective transcending. This was such a rich talk that even if you heard it, you may wanna hear it again. And if you missed it, this is your chance to hear this not to be missed talk. I'd also like to let everybody know that you can join us today at the same place at 4 p.m. Central for TM Talks where our guest is Donna Hauser a top corporate executive with Christian Dior and a consultant on the benefits of the Transcendental Meditation Program for today's working women. The title of her talk will be Saving Your Sanity While Enhancing Your Happiness. 
You can find the link to this talk today by visiting the website tmeevents.org. That will um, be tomorrow. I mean, that will be today at 4 p.m. Central. And um, I also want everyone to know that this talk will be replayed, and you can—I mean, well, you can view a replay. Excuse me, uh, at miutalks.org, and this talk should be up by Wednesday. I have a feeling, Tom, we may be asking you back because there are just so many questions that weren't answered. So again, thank you so much and thank everyone for joining us and everybody have a wonderful day.